good evening, church family. Let's all stand together as we begin this time of worship. Father, we just want to lift up your name tonight. May we just focus on, on you, and may we receive your word, and may we just give you the glory and praise in this time of worship. And have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Better than all this world, better than all I know, better than life itself, your love is. All that I have is yours, all that I'm living for, all that I need is in you. Stand in awe of all that you are. I stand in awe of you and everything unto you, everything held by you. All of my hope is in you, Jesus. Nothing compares to you, nothing will take your place. All of our trust is in you, Lord. You alone, you alone are better than life, than anything in this world. You alone are all I want, and everything you are good. I stand in awe of all that you are. I stand. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. to darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I am to worship here I am to bow down 
Let's all stand together. Lord, here we are to worship you. Amen. Let's all take a minute and say hello to your neighbor. Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're nice and well-fed. Those of you who are here for the summer dinners, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, so happy for the whole worship team tonight. All of them are great and wonderful. They were giving me a hard time because I only had a special reaction to Mario down there in the end uh, playing the box. Mario was in the youth group uh, that I was uh, pastoring, how long ago was that? I don't know, it was a long time ago. And look, here he is today, a strapping young man. And so, you know, he's not always here. I was excited to see Mario. Okay, a few announcements to share with you, and then we'll continue to worship the Lord together. 
Uh, we've got the dates uh, for the Israel trip uh, for 2024, May 7th through May 18th. I believe we're still waiting on just a few little details to have all the information uh, that you need uh, to know about that trip, but we want to make those dates available to you, something to be thinking about, praying about, joining with us on our next trip to Israel. Uh, we have the dates in there for the youth summer camp. This is July 14th through the 17th at Pine Valley Bible Conference Center. This is for junior high all the way up to 12th grade. If you have a junior high or high school student, you might want to talk to them about this camp. Uh, it just seems like they always have a really fun, really special time. Uh, God does some incredible things in the hearts of our young people at these camps, so you might want to uh, talk to them about that, pray about that opportunity. Uh, let's see. I'm sort of debating. I'm just reading all of them. I guess I'm just reading all of them. Kitchen ministry. They're looking for a couple volunteers after second service on Sunday. Great way to serve the body here. Uh, the college and career group, they're going to be taking a few Sundays off, July 2nd, July 9th. They're going to start back up on the 16th. So if you're in that college and career group, something to uh, take note of there. Uh, prayer meeting will be after this, uh, is this, this coming Sunday? Yeah, it is, July 2nd. Uh, the first Sunday of the month, we gather together as a church body to pray. The dates for Vacation Bible School are in there now that's July 24th through the 28th, uh, kids four years old, all the way up to sixth grade. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that we do all year long. We've got hundreds of kids. We get hundreds of volunteers as well. So all of the registration forms that you need are out there in the lobby. But with that, why don't we go ahead and we'll continue to worship the Lord. But let's just come before him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather here together as your people and meet with you and worship you. Lord, we do just pray that you'd have your hand upon this time. Lord, we pray that this time of worship, as we sing the song to you, Lord, that it would bless your heart, that it would just bring glory and honor to your name. We pray that you would draw us into your presence and that as your word goes out, that it would go out with power and authority, that it would accomplish all that you desire it to, that we would have ears to hear and hearts that are ready to receive all that you have for us. We love you, we praise you, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you, Lord, that we are not alone in this world. Lord, we thank you for that, and we just pray for James as you speak through him tonight. Just uh, open our ears, soften our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're in Luke chapter 12, if you want to open up your Bibles there. Luke chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 49 through 59 tonight. As we've gone through this chapter, the series of warnings that Jesus is giving, first addressing the crowd, eventually he turns his attention specifically to the disciples. By the time we end the chapter, he makes his way back to talking to the entire crowd, all of the group of people that was there listening. And there's sort of been this transition from the way that an unbeliever lives his life, and there's a contrast that's being established with as a child of God, as a Christian, the way that we should be living, and it's been given through this series of warnings. And so after Jesus warns about hypocrisy, after he warns about covetousness, and he says, this is the way that the world lives. They live in hypocrisy. Oh, there might be some form of religion. There might be some form of outward spirituality, but they don't really care about what God thinks. They really only care about what other people think. It's all for show. It's all fake. It's phony. They're just pretending to be somebody that they're not. Or he talks about covetousness and someone who has this longing, this greed, this desire for more and more. It's never enough. Wanting what they don't have, wanting what they can't have, always trying to accumulate wealth, accumulate possessions, accumulate power, really living as if this life is all there is. There is no God. There's no God that's going to help them. There's no God that's going to provide for them. There's no God that they're going to be held accountable to. And so they're living their lives, scurrying along, trying to accumulate as many things as possible, pretending to be somebody that they're not. Jesus says, this is the way that the world lives. And although that might be the earmark of an unbeliever, at the same time, he's warning us as disciples, he's warning us as Christians, be careful. Don't let that kind of mentality creep into your life because it might be ultimately true of the religious leaders who practice hypocrisy. It might be ultimately true of someone who is consumed by greed and covetousness who is walking away from the Lord. But be careful because these things can creep into your life if you're not on guard, if you're not walking closely with the Lord. And so this contrast has been established, but then as he addresses the believers, he says, so you guys don't worry about these things. Don't worry, don't be consumed with what you're gonna eat and what you're gonna wear and the basic provisions of life. Understand, you have a loving heavenly father who wants to take care of you. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers. You're more valuable than birds. You're more valuable than flowers. He's going to take care of you so you don't have to be worried about these things. Instead, seek God's kingdom first. Put Jesus first in your life. Seek after his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you. All of these other things will fall into its proper place, fall into its proper perspective when you're putting God first. And then he tells this parable of the faithful and the evil servant. He says of the faithful servant, well, he's going to have his waist girded and his lamp is burning. He's ready to work. He's ready to serve. He understands his role in the kingdom of God. His lamp is burning. He's grounded in the word of God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. God's word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And his Holy Spirit, he empowers us to serve him. And so he says this faithful servant, he's ready to work, he's ready to serve, he's grounded in the word, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is watching. He is waiting for his master's return. He is ready at a moment's notice. There's a knock on the door and he opens it right up and he's ready to greet his master. And so he says that good That faithful servant is the one who's working, serving, 
in the word, filled with the Holy Spirit, waiting, expecting his master's return. The evil servant, Jesus says, is the one who says in his heart, oh, my master delays his coming. Oh, there's plenty of time. I'm not saying he's never coming back, but he's not coming back tonight. It's not gonna be this week. I don't have to deal with all of these things right away. Oh, sure, I know there's some things in my life that probably need to be straightened out, but my master delays his coming. And of course, that servant is led into carnality and sin, and he falls very quickly, very sharply. And of course, that's where that kind of mentality always leads. Whenever we just act as if we have all the time in the world, whenever we act as if there's no sense of urgency in our relationship with the Lord, and whether it's our own death, whether it's the rapture and Jesus coming again, the truth is we don't know how long we have, but every once in a while in our flesh, we fall into that same trap, into that same mentality, oh, there's plenty of time, and we use that as a way to put off the things that God wants to do in our life. And whenever we do that, you can't just shift into neutral. Have you noticed that spiritually? You can't just stay right where you're at. You're either growing in your relationship with the Lord or falling away. And so when we push off the things that God wants to do, and God might be speaking to some of you, maybe some of you tonight, maybe this week, maybe this season of your life, you know there's some things that he wants to do. And whenever we hold that off, it's always gonna lead us down a destructive path. It's always gonna lead us down to sin and carnality, and that's what this wicked, evil servant experienced, and of course, he was gonna be held accountable for his actions. Now, it's in our section here tonight that you have one of the less quotable verses of Jesus. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say none of you have this on a magnet on your refrigerator. None of you have this like in a nice cursive font over some journal that you keep. It comes in verse 49 when Jesus said, I came to send fire on the earth. <laughs> Not exactly one of his most well-known lines from scripture. I've come to send fire on the earth, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He says, I came to send fire on the earth, and then he sort of doubles down on it when he says, and I wish it was already kindled. I wish it already started. This thing just needs to get rolling. Now, we'll try to unpack that as we go through our study and look at all of the different ways that that could be implied and the application there. But at the very least, I think that we could say that Jesus is oftentimes a little more extreme than most people give him credit for. Now, certainly, the world waters down the statements of Jesus and the message of Jesus. The world would say, oh, he was all about peace and he was all about love and he was all about accepting other people. We would expect that from the unbeliever to not really know what Jesus said and maybe water down some of his more extreme statements. But the truth is, is sometimes even as believers we can do that. Sometimes even as Christians, we wanna take a little bit of the edge off of things that Jesus said because otherwise it can be a little convicting. But the truth is he said some extreme things. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better to be maimed and go into the kingdom of heaven than to be whole and go to hell. That's a pretty extreme statement. Now, I'm thankful for the totality of scripture. I think that's always important. Compare the Bible with the Bible. I think there's incredible balance there when we compare scripture with scripture. We don't go too far down any one rabbit hole and we can understand the whole counsel of God. And we wanna be careful to realize, well, when there are phrases and idioms and expressions and parables and understand what Jesus is saying, I don't think he's saying that you should literally cut off your hand, but I think he is saying you need to take an extreme stance towards sin. Don't put yourself in a place of temptation. Don't make provision for your flesh to take an extreme stance. And so we look at the statements of Jesus and we realize that sometimes he said things that we might consider extreme. Here he says, I came to set a fire on the earth. Now a fire can get wild. A fire can really disrupt things. Of course, here in Southern California, we're well aware of that. Seasonally, we get wildfires. 
right? The Santa Ana winds start blowing and those hot, dry conditions and a fire can get out of control quickly. In the middle of a firestorm, the wind direction can change and we do our very best to try and stop it and contain it and put it out, but the reality is sometimes we're at the mercy of which direction that fire chooses to go and it's just sort of consuming everything in its path. Of course, at the very same time, fire can be used for a lot of things. It can be used for warmth. It can be used for light. It can be used to purify precious metals. Of course, fire could be used to purify gold, purify silver, bring those impurities to the surface that what would be remaining is only that precious metal. So it can be used for many things. And yet Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. You know, there may have been times and places in our past where Christianity could provide you with a pretty safe, comfortable life. I think there were times in our past where being a Christian meant you probably fit in. Well, join the club. Oh, we're all Christians. Oh, we're kind of a Christian nation. And of course, you might have had the struggle with, okay, well, do they really know the Lord Are they actually born again? Do they really know Jesus or is it just some form of religion? But there was a time in our past where being a Christian meant that you weren't really ruffling any feathers, you kind of fit in with the majority and it was easier to live a quiet, peaceable life. More and more that doesn't seem to be the case. More and more it would seem that being a follower of Jesus, especially if you're saying, I believe this book, is the inspired, inerrant word of God. This is the authority. This is what I'm going to follow after. I have a relationship with God. The more that we do that in the culture and the society that we live in, the more opposition that we're going to face, the greater struggle there's going to be, the more that we'll be going against the flow. And here's the thing. I think God wants us to go against the flow. I think God wants there to be clear lines that are drawn. I think he still wants to set a fire that there would be this clear distinction. In a world that seems dead set on mixing together right and wrong and good and evil, and up is down and down is up, and while there's a church that's perhaps tempted to sort of placate to that and water down scripture and try and fit in with what's being accepted in our time, I think God is calling us to live for him and to stand on the authority of his word. Now, with that being said, I don't think that's an excuse to be unloving, to be rude, to be obnoxious, to look to start fights with people. Let's face it, there's some part of our flesh that we might get a little too excited about that idea. Like, yeah, we're at war with people. You know, let's put them in their place. Let's tell them all the ways that they're wrong. And that's not what God is calling us to do. Human beings are not the enemy. (laughs) The enemy is the enemy. The devil's the enemy. Sin is the problem. Human beings God loves. And so we need to be compassionate, but we do need to love them enough to speak the truth and to demonstrate the difference between a life that's marked by Jesus and someone who has no relationship with him at all. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. I'll start reading here at verse 49. I'll read down to verse 53, and we'll get into our study. Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against his father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, as if they needed any help there. But there's one more thing. that I'm just kidding. It's just a joke. Nobody found that funny. Maybe your mother-in-law is here with you. It's like, I didn't find that funny. It's just a joke. Okay, Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. So what does that mean? I came to send fire on the earth. You know, scholars are somewhat divided on this issue. Some think that Jesus is talking about judgment that will collectively come upon the nation of Israel for rejecting him. 
Now, there's plenty of imagery in the Bible as it relates to judgment and fire, and so it can be easy to make that connection. And while we know that God hasn't cast off Israel, he didn't back then, and he still hasn't today, he has a plan for them. And yet at the same time, it does become clear that the overall assessment of Jesus was that the nation of Israel was rejecting him. That's not to say completely. Of course, all of the disciples were Jewish. Most of the early church would be Jewish. And so there were some who received him. But his overall assessment between the religious leaders and the nation as a whole was that he was being rejected by them. We're just a short chapter away from Jesus weeping over Jerusalem as he's coming into it. Saying, if you would have only known the things that belong to you, if you would have only known that this is your day and the things that have been prepared for you, but now they're hidden from your eyes and sudden destruction is going to come upon you. And so there would be fire, there would be judgment that would be coming. In AD 70, Titus, Vespasian, the Romans, they come in and they destroy Jerusalem. They level the temple. They scatter the Jewish people throughout the known world. And so it is true, judgment would be coming. Some think, of course, though, that the judgment is broader than that, not just talking about Israel and their rejection of Jesus, but really anyone that would reject him. In Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 John the Baptist said this, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, sometimes when we think of that statement, he's gonna baptize you, Jesus is gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, we might think of that in terms of Oh, Lord, set a fire in my heart. I want to be on fire for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And we think about the purity. We think about the power that fire could bring into the believer's life. And while I do think there's something to be said, it's interesting, though, in Luke chapter 3, verse 17, he goes on to say his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so there he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. It would at least seem in part that the fire he's talking about is judgment. Chaff being burned with unquenchable fire, that sounds like judgment on any who would reject Jesus. And so not just limiting it to the nation of Israel's rejection of the Lord, but perhaps anyone that would reject him, there could be fire, there could be judgment. And yet still others think that perhaps the fire that's being spoken of here could be a reference to the church, could be a reference to believers. And while I think that statement from John the Baptist that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, while that may imply judgment on the unbeliever, I think there probably is something to be said for the Christian, for someone who has received Christ, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We know from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that our faith is tested by fire. Our faith being much more precious than any gold or any stone that would perish away, our faith is tested by fire. And whether that's through circumstances, whether that's through some time of trial or suffering, our faith can be tested by fire and it's something that God allows into our life because it purifies us, because it brings us into a closer relationship with him, because it might bring things to the surface that we didn't realize were there. Nobody likes to be tested by fire. Nobody likes the temperature being turned up in their own lives, and yet isn't it true? When we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, it's one thing to say what you think is in your heart, and it's another thing to be there in the middle of a storm, in the middle of some trial or challenge, and your heart is revealed, and sometimes in those moments, things that you didn't even realize were there, they come to the surface. And maybe it's something to repent from. Maybe it's something to confess. Of course, every once in a while, when we're walking closely with the Lord, that fire and that trial can actually reveal something in you that's good that you didn't know was there. Like, wow, 
I did trust the Lord. How about that? Wow, I did stand on his word and, and I believed in his promises and he's got me through this difficult time. But there's always an opportunity to grow. There's always an opportunity to allow the Lord to be working in our life. Of course, Jesus already said, let your lamps be burning. Let the word of God and let the Holy Spirit bring light and bring illumination to your life, to your walk, to your witness in the world. I think of the two men on the road to Emmaus after Jesus had died on the cross and he had risen from the dead, but they weren't aware. And they're walking with Jesus and he was sharing things with them. And then afterwards, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke with us by the way, when he opened up the scriptures to us? Didn't our hearts burn within us? He light. He lit this fire in our hearts just as he was speaking, just as he was opening up the scriptures. And I think that's something that God does. He puts a fire in us and it brings purity to our life. It brings purity to our faith. It brings power to our walk and illumination that we would be able to see. And he gives us this passion to grow in a relationship with him. And so which is it? Are we talking about judgment? that would be coming upon the nation of Israel? Are we talking about judgment that would be coming upon anybody that would reject Jesus? Are we talking about purity or power to the life of the unbeliever? What does Jesus mean when he says, I'm gonna send fire to the earth? I tend to think that he had all of those things in view. I think he probably had all of those things in mind as he's sharing all of this. Really, it's a matter of where you're at. In your relationship with God, Jesus says, I'm going to send fire. Depending on where you stand with God, that could be a really good thing or that could be a really bad thing. <laughs> if I'm not right with God, the Bible says I'm at war with him. I'm rebelling against him. I'm fighting against him. I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. And so this God that I'm at war with because I'm a sinner and rebelling against him, he says, I'm going to send fire. Well, that sounds bad. That sounds like I might experience wrath. I might experience judgment. But if I know him and I love him and I have a relationship with him and I'm growing and I'm walking, he says, I'm going to send fire. Then it's like, oh, praise the Lord. Because you know what? The world that we're living in is not doing well. I'm not sure if you noticed. I'm not sure how close your finger is to the pulse of how well the world is doing. I'm not sure how depressed you get if you watch the news for any length of time and you see some of the decisions that are being made right here locally or in our state or in our country or in our world and some of the horrible atrocities taking place. Not doing so well. And so if I'm walking with Jesus, it's like, oh yeah, send a fire. I think as Jesus was looking at the world that he was in, this world that was marked by sin, that was fallen, all of this pain, all of this destruction, all of this bloodshed, all of this violence, all of this immorality, all of the issues that they were facing in their day. And so he says, I've, I've come to send fire. I need to wake these people up. I need there to be this clear line, this clear distinction and so it's really a matter of which side of the equation are you on. The choice is yours. Jesus says, I'm coming to send fire. And so is that going to be wonderful or is that going to be frightening? The choice is yours. But if the kingdom of God is coming to earth, the implication would be, well, the kingdom of darkness needs to be burned down. There's one kingdom that needs to fall as another kingdom is being established. And so I think probably all of those things are in view when Jesus says, I've come to send fire on the earth, and I wish that it was already kindled. But then he says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. And so Jesus says, before I can send this fire to the earth that would bring power and purity to the believer's but could potentially bring judgment to others. Before I can send this fire to the earth, he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. Now, the language here seems to be rather clear that Jesus has the cross in view. He said something similar, similar kind of language anyways, in Mark chapter 10, verse 38, when the disciples are asking, hey, I want to sit at your right hand, I want to sit at your left. And Jesus said, you do not know what you ask. 
Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Hey, we want to sit at your right hand and your left in glory. We want to be in that position of power and authority. Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you have the same baptism that I'm going to experience? And of course, if you remember from the story, they're like, yeah, (laughs) we can. And they didn't really know what they were saying. And Jesus goes, well, the truth is, as you will, you're going to be martyred. You're going to suffer and you die. You, you still don't understand what you're saying. And so the reference here to this baptism that's in front of them seems to be speaking of the cross. And with this urgency that Jesus had to get things moving, to, to see the kingdom of darkness come to an end, to set a fire on the earth, the cross had to come first. And he says, how distressed I am till it's accomplished. He says, how distressed I am. That word distressed, it means pressed or held by. It's the same word that's used of the multitudes when it says that the multitudes thronged him, pressing in on every side. You get the picture sometimes as Jesus is walking around with these crowds of people, 10, 15, 20, 30,000 people, and he's doing these miracles, and he's teaching everybody you kind of get the picture that sometimes they were sort of worked up almost into a frenzy. Everybody pressing in. Everybody trying to touch Jesus and get near Jesus. And it would say the multitudes thronged him. They're pressing him. They're holding him almost to the point of suffocation. Almost to the point where you can't even get a breath in. It's the same word that Jesus used here in connection to the cross. He says, how distressed I am until it's accomplished. This baptism, and what a fitting word, baptism, when we're talking about his suffering, when we're talking about the cross, when we're talking about what he would have to endure on our behalf. He didn't tiptoe into it. He wasn't sprinkled with it. It was a baptism. It was a full immersion into suffering, into the wrath of God, into this punishment of sin. And he says, how I'm distressed until it's accomplished, how I'm pressed on every side. It's consuming me. Like if you've ever been through a very difficult time, if if there's ever been a, a loss of a loved one, someone very close to you, and it's just consuming, and it's at the very forefront of your mind, and you might have to go through the motions, and you're doing other things, and you're getting things done, but really, it's like you can't distract yourself from it, and that grief can just be overwhelming, and you're thinking about it constantly. That's what Jesus is describing when he's talking about the cross that's in front of him how distressed he is until it's accomplished, how he's pressed on every side, how he's going about his day, he's going about his ministry, he's ministering to the disciples, he's speaking to the crowd, he's healing the sick, he's speaking to the religious leaders, but at the forefront of his mind is this baptism that's in front of him, this suffering that he's about to enter into that all that he is going to endure on your behalf and on my behalf as the sin of the world would be placed upon him. He says, how distressed I am. And of all of the things that Jesus did, cleansing the leper had never been done before. You know, Jesus, he's sending the lepers into the, the priest to go through this ceremony prescribed in the Bible. They had never gone through that ceremony. As far as we know, up until that point, There was no one in the nation of Israel, there was no Jewish person that had been cleansed of leprosy and had gone through the ceremony as prescribed in Scripture. And yet Jesus arrives on the scene and suddenly all of these lepers start coming in. He's cleansing the leper and he's opening up the eyes of the blind and he's raising the dead. He's walking on water and yet we never read of Jesus being distressed. We never read of Jesus sweating over these things, like it was some difficult thing, some challenge. You know, Jesus is huffing and puffing in the corner. Oh, I just cast this demon out. It was really hard. Took a lot out of me. No, just with power and authority, Jesus says the word and it's done. He didn't sweat over any of those things. And yet, for the cross in the garden of Gethsemane, not only is he sweating, he's sweating drops of blood 
under this extreme weight, this extreme pressure, this baptism that was in front of him, this cup that he was gonna have to drink, this cup of God's wrath as God's judgment would be poured upon him, the judgment that should have fallen on you, should have fallen on me, the sin of the world placed upon him, he was sweating drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, if there's any other way, if there's any other means of salvation, then let this cup pass from me. You know, as a believer, when you first came to the Lord, when you first put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're born again into his family, and all of a sudden there's this realization that you've been separated from God, but now you've been forgiven and you're made right with him Now, for the first time, your spirit is alive, and you can hear from him, and he can speak to you, and you open up your word, and you read scripture, and God speaks directly into your life, and you actually want to come to church, because in church, this is a place where you're fellowshipping with other people, but you're fellowshipping with God, and you're made alive, you're a new creation in Christ, and you have this relationship with him, and there's nothing like it in the world. But of course, if you walk with the Lord for any number of years, then one of the things you know that from time to time, sin can creep in. And of course, one of the greatest penalties and consequences of that sin, more than anything that you could say to yourself, more than anything that anyone could say to you, when you allow it to have a place in your life that shouldn't be, oh, that fellowship that you were experiencing with God is somehow interrupted. Not that you lost your salvation, not that God doesn't love you anymore, but because sin has crept in and it hasn't been repented from, it's bringing some kind of separation. And all this closeness that I was experiencing with God, now it's been interrupted and oh, I got to confess it, I got to repent, I need to get back right with the Lord because I want to be in a right relationship with him. It's that separation from that fellowship. Oh, that's where the real punishment, that's where the real consequence is. And I wanna get rid of that, Lord, because I wanna be back in the center of a good relationship with you. Jesus sweating drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. He's considering the fact that as God's wrath is poured upon him, as the sin of the world is placed upon him, that he would experience death, that he would experience somehow, some way, separation from the Father. And it was so intense, it was so severe, he's sweating drops of blood, and yet he endured it, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. He endures the cross, knowing what it would accomplish. He says, This baptism is in front of me and how I'm pressed, how I'm held by these things until it is accomplished, he said. There's something to be accomplished there. Actually, it's the very same word that's used in John chapter 19. As Jesus is dying on the cross, he used the very same word. He says, I'm hard pressed, I'm held by these things until it is accomplished He uses the same word in John 19 when he cries out from the cross, it is finished. It is accomplished. Same word that's used here, tetelestai, paid in full. The sin, the debt that we owed, the price that had to be paid, paid in full. So for us who believe in Jesus, oh, there's nothing that can separate us from his love. Oh, we, we cannot experience condemnation and judgment because he paid for our sin in full. It was accomplished. He says, how distressed I am until it's accomplished, until I experience this baptism. He says in verse 51, do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. And he speaks of homes being divided against each other and father against son and mother against daughter, and the division that could potentially come as someone would put their faith and trust in Jesus. And it's not to say that somehow Jesus doesn't want peace or that somehow he approves of the problems or division that it might cause. 
But that's just it. You can't have peace on earth until you have peace with God. That's the problem with the worldly concept of peace and love. You know, can't we all just love each other? Can't we all just coexist? No, we can't. That's the problem. That's the issue. You know, can you imagine telling a Jewish person in Nazi Germany, hey, can't you just live in peace here? No, not while Hitler's around. And not while there's death camps. No, that's going to have to be addressed before we could ever experience peace. And you can't have peace on earth until there's peace with God. That's true on a world level, a society level, but it's also true on a personal level. Someone says, well, I just want peace in my life. You need to be right with God. You need to be right with Jesus. You need to surrender to him. You need to turn from the direction that you're going in. You're at war with God, and there's landmines all around, and trap doors under your feet, and shots are being fired, and you're running and hiding and ducking. There can't be any peace unless you're right with him. And someone says, oh, I just want life, and I just want peace. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. And unless we're right with God, then we're going to be at war with him. And so Jesus said, houses will be divided against each other. Many of you have experienced that. Maybe when you first became a believer and you went home and you told your parents the good news. Hey, I'm following after Jesus now. Maybe you had to come home and tell some friends. Maybe even some of you had to come home and tell a spouse. Hey, I got a new story. I'm following Jesus now. Expecting everybody that would just automatically rejoice. Perhaps some of you have adult children that have walked away from the Lord and now there's a wedge between you two because you're still following after Jesus and they're not committed to walking with him and it can produce division in our home. I remember being shocked by these things. I just assumed everybody would be happy because before I knew Jesus, my life was a mess. My life was falling apart drugs and alcohol and all kinds of problems and all kinds of issues. There were times where I was just overcome with depression and suicidal thoughts. I would lie to my best friend. I would steal from my best friend. I was a horrible person. Life falling apart, not going anywhere good, and that was just sort of known. Everybody kind of laughed. Everybody kind of joked. You know, what was my life gonna become? And everybody got a kick out of it. And so I just assumed when I got saved, when I got rescued. Now I'm not so depressed. Now there's some joy and some hope in my life, and now I'm not gonna lie to your face. Now I'm not gonna steal from you. I might actually help. Can you believe it? You know, do you, is there something I can do? Is there, something, is there some way that I could help you out in the situation that you're in, a completely different person? I just assumed everybody would be happy. What a shock that some people were quite upset <laughs> Apparently, they wanted the depressed, suicidal guy that would steal from them. They wanted that more than a Christian, than someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I remember being so surprised. And of course, you realize these people that I thought were my friends, these people that I thought cared about me, clearly, you don't care about me at all. You would rather that I'd be dead in a ditch somewhere than to be a follower of Jesus. And yet, at the same time, We probably shouldn't be surprised by these things. That's exactly what the Bible says. Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says this, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, we are the aroma of life leading to life. He says, we're the fragrance of Christ. Everywhere we go, we have the fragrance of Jesus. And that is either going to be the fragrance of life or the fragrance of death. (laughs) To people who know the Lord or to people who are responding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, if you're following after him, oh, it's the fragrance of life. You know, like we all know those people that just always smell good. You know, you guys know Mickey. 
the drummer on Sundays. He always smells good. Every time I walk by him, it's like, man, he just looks like he's just freshly cleaned and he's got some cologne and stuff on. I walk by him like, oh man, he just smells good. And as a Christian, when you're following after the Lord, you're in a good relationship with him, you come around other people and it's that fragrance of Christ. It's this love in their eyes. It's it's this connection that they have with God. It's the encouragement that they bring. Oh, they're bringing the aroma of life. I want to be around that person. When I'm around him, I'm encouraged. When I'm around him, oh, it's, it's edifying. And, and so I want to be close. Or someone who is responding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and they know they need Jesus, and they get around a Christian, oh, yeah, tell me. What do I need to do? How do I respond how do I begin a relationship with God? It's the fragrance of life. But you get around somebody who doesn't know the Lord. You get around somebody who's rejecting him. You get around somebody who they want nothing to do with Jesus. That same fragrance of Christ now becomes the aroma of death. I have these three little dogs, and one of them in particular, Bruno. He's probably the smallest one. He's, his breath is the fragrance of death. And I've tried everything. I don't, you know, every time I talk about it, I always get somebody, oh, you got to try this toothbrush and you got to try this dog treat. Look, we tried everything, okay? It's the fragrance of death. Just don't get close to his mouth. That's the only issue. It's just straight up zombie death. It's just horrible. Fragrance of death. When we get around unbelievers, when we get around someone who is rejecting God, rejecting Jesus, it's the fragrance of death. It's horrible to them because Jesus said in John chapter 3, the condemnation is that light has come into the world and some love darkness more than they love light. They don't want to come into the light. They don't want their deeds to be exposed. And so there's some people that there will be division. There's some people that are never going to accept you as a follower of Jesus because they're rejecting the Lord themselves and you bring the fragrance of death, and it's only a reminder of the things that they're not doing. It's only a reminder that they're not right with God, and so they'll push you away. And the truth is, in some circumstances, that can actually be the most gracious and compassionate thing that God could do, that he would establish a clear line, that you get around a genuine believer, oh, you're not comfortable, you get around a genuine believer and you wanna push them away, that's something that God can use to draw a clear line to help them understand, yeah, you're far from me. The reason you don't wanna be around him, the reason you don't wanna be around her is because you're not right with me, it's something that God can use to get a hold of their life. Verse 54 says, then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Now, we know from Matthew's gospel what prompted this was the religious leaders, they came to Jesus seeking a sign. And of course, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of ludicrous because there has just been sign after sign after sign. John the Baptist was his forerunner preaching and teaching and thousands are coming out to hear John and to be baptized. John points to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now there's these thousands upon thousands coming to hear Jesus and he's doing all of these miracles and all of these lepers are coming into the temple. Hey, perform the ceremony on me. I'm cleansed and he's opening up the eyes of the blind, and all of these miracles are being performed, not to mention all of the Old Testament prophecy, where the Messiah was gonna be born, and what family he was gonna be a part of, even the exact day that he would arrive on the scene in Daniel chapter nine. Jesus says, you're able to look at the weather, and you're able to discern the times. How is it that you can't discern this time? And the language that's being used here in Luke 12, Jesus is implying you could know, but you're choosing not to. You remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus very early on in his ministry, Nicodemus a Pharisee, and he said, we know that you must come from God. Nobody could be doing the things that you're doing unless God was with him. Nicodemus said, the Pharisee, this teacher of Israel, yeah, we know that you must come from God. So Jesus is saying to them, you could know the time, 
But it's like you're choosing not to. You're choosing to be ignorant. Now here in our context, Jesus says, I've come to set a fire on the earth. I've come to set a fire in the heart of believers, and that may cause some division, but it's necessary because time is short and judgment is coming, and you need to discern the times. And just as Jesus would look at that generation, and he would say, you're choosing not to discern the times. How is it that you don't realize this time that I'm here on earth is significant, and maybe you should be paying attention? As much as Jesus could say that to that generation, couldn't he say the same thing to us? Couldn't he say to us, how do you not discern the times that you're living in? Are you choosing to be ignorant of these things? Are you supposing that it's some coincidence that somehow exactly what the Bible said would be happening in the last days is happening? That Israel would be reborn again as a nation, that they would be dwelling securely in the land the enemies that would be coming against Israel are all forming alliances just like the Bible predicted that Jesus in Matthew 24 when he talked about birth pangs, contractions that are getting closer and closer together, more and more intense. He says nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, that this is gonna escalate, that this is gonna happen on a global level. And here we are, we've had World War I, we've had World War II, there isn't anyone who thinks that we would survive World War III. Are these contractions that are getting closer and closer together and becoming more and more intense? Is it any coincidence that we're clearly moving towards a one-world government, a one-world currency, that there would be a mark that everybody has to have, making it impossible to buy or sell without it? You know, sometimes it's been speculated, oh, maybe that could be just some literal mark on somebody's skin. And yet at the same time, well, that seems like a system that could be cheated. That seems like a system you could probably still fool somebody into buying and selling. But if it's some sort of digital currency, if there's some sort of mark, if there's some sort of chip, you have to have it in order to be able to buy and sell. Is it any coincidence all of that technology is here. All of these things that the Bible said, well, this is what's gonna be happening in the last days. And when you see these things begin to happen, look up, your redemption draws nigh. Couldn't Jesus say the same thing to us? How is it that you're choosing not to be aware of these things, choosing not to be aware of the days in which you're living? We'll close here with these verses, verse 57 to 59. Yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right when you go with your adversary to the magistrate? Make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. So obviously a lot of legal language being used here, uh, going to the judge, going to the magistrate, uh, there's some issue, and the implication seems to be at a time where you know that you're guilty, at a time where you know that you've wronged someone, and he says, okay, I'm gonna take you before the judge. Jesus said, you're smart enough in that situation to plead your case with the guy, to try and work out some deal. Hey, let's settle this thing out of court. Uh, there was a time a while back, I was turning right onto a busy street, and there was a car in front of me, and cars are coming down this way, and I'm, I'm looking at the car, and I'm looking them, and all of a sudden, there's this big opening, and the car in front of me starts to go like it's gonna turn right, and so I'm still looking this way, and it started to go, and then so I go, and then I turn, and up oh, it stopped for some unexplained reason, and so I slam on my brakes, and I just, just a little love tap, just a little ding on the back of this van, and these Buddhist monks get out of the van, and, you know, they're wearing their robes and stuff. And, and I'm like, hello, brothers, you know. And uh, I say, hey, uh, you know, surely we can handle these things without, you know, involving our insurance and, and the law and whatnot. It was still very expensive. I probably should have let the insurance handle it. But he says you're smart enough to do that. You're smart enough to know, hey, you're at wrong. You're at fault. Don't go to the judge don't be held to the letter of the law. You're smart enough. Hey, if there's an opportunity to settle, then settle, especially if you know that you're guilty. Jesus is saying you're smart enough to do that. 
Are you smart enough to get right with God? Now, of course, people can read too far into this. It's a parable. You could come up with all kinds of strange ideas about works righteousness and working your debt off. You could get some strange ideas about purgatory and you go to this temporary waiting place. It's a parable. It's illustrating the main point. And the main point is, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the opportunity that we have before we go before the judge, before we stand in front of him and the books of sin is opened. Any unbeliever, anyone who doesn't know Jesus, books will be opened up with your recorded sins one by one. Imagine the length of those books. I could have filled one by the time I was five. Imagine the length of those books. And one by one, they're gone over and there's no argument. There's no defense. There's no excuse to be held accountable. The Bible says, no, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Just like the door on the ark, it remained open. All the while, as Noah is building, as his family is entering in, the door on the ark remained open until one day it was shut. And it was shut by God. The door on the ark is open. And so now is the opportunity that we have to get right with him. So Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. And that might be frightening. If we're far from him, that might be exactly what we want to hear. If we're ready to see God move, if we're ready to see God work. But I think of the words that Jesus had to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. He said this church that was neither hot nor cold. He says, I wish that you were one or the other. I wish you were hot. I wish you were on fire. I wish you had a close relationship with me, or I wish you were cold. I wish you were distant. I, I wish it was clear. As the world descends into chaos and is mixing all of these things, we know that there's going to be part of the church that they sort of follow that same course, and they're a little bit hot, and they're a little bit cold, and it just kind of is lukewarm, and living in this gray area, Jesus said, I wish that you were one or the other. I wish you were hot or cold. He says, because you're lukewarm, I want to spit you from my mouth. And of course, it's to that Laodicean church that he ends the letter and he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and dine with him and he with me. Jesus says, no, you, you need to turn. You need to repent. You, you need to come to me. You, you think that you're wealthy. You think that you're rich. You have need of nothing. You don't realize that you're poor, you're miserable, you're blind, you're naked. Come to me, Jesus said. And if you hear my voice, if you hear me knocking at the door of your heart, if you open it, I'll come in. I'll light a fire in you once again where I can burn bright and I can bring purity and I can bring power and I can bring help to your life and you can be a part of the work that I'm doing in the world. But it's a choice, it's a decision that each one of us has to make. Let's come before the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is powerful, that it is authoritative. We thank you that it, it's alive, that it applies to each one of us. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would meet with each one. Lord, I pray that not only would we have the ears to hear you, Lord, the heart to receive into our life what you have, but, Lord, give us the power, give us the strength that we need to respond. And so for anyone here tonight that you've been putting some things on their heart, maybe it's about turning from sin, turning to you, maybe it's about surrender, maybe it's about going deeper, maybe it's about stepping out in ministry. Lord, whatever it is, I pray that you'd meet with each one in a powerful way, give them the power, give them the strength that they need to respond to you in the way that you would have them. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. You alone are better than life, anything in this world. You alone are all I want, and everything you are good. I stand in awe of all that you are. I stand. anything in this world you alone are all i want in everything you are good i 
We'll be available to talk with you, pray with you right down here in front. Love to be able to do that. Otherwise, enjoy some fellowship. Go see what your kids have uh, crafted and put together and have a wonderful night in the Lord.